So as a child psychologist, they asked me to give a presentation on whether or not I thought the Common Core standards were developmentally appropriate. My talk is going to be sort of at the other end of the spectrum, looking at the entering grades, um, trying to see if the standards look okay for them. So uh, why? Why would we even care if they're developmentally appropriate? Well, you can answer that with one word, and that, that word is stress. Uh, kids that are subjected to standards that aren't appropriate will be more stressed, and this is actually shown to be true in research. So this is just one of the research studies that has been done, but they just looked at kindergartners in a classroom, compared them in a developmentally appropriate classroom and one that wasn't, and the kids in the one that wasn't were in there biting their nails and twirling their hair and, and doing some of these other things, tremors and ticks and looking nervous. Um, and I like this one about having physical aches and pains because as a psychologist I can tell you that's the first sign of anxiety when your kids are little. So um, this is why it's important to really think about this. So to do this, I have to sort of give you a crash course in child development. But basically, in a nutshell, it means that we don't think that kids' brains are the same as adults' brains. They're different. They're still developing. And they keep developing from the time they're born until they're adults and even onwards. Um, so we generally do a pretty good job of this when our kids are babies and toddlers. You know, if a child hits its mom's mouth while they're holding the infant, we don't arrest that infant for assault, right? We all know, <laughs> didn't mean to do that. Uh, so we do a good job. But once they start talking and start reasoning, we sort of stop doing that. And we generally think, well, if you're nice to them and you don't shame them, then you're being developmentally appropriate. But that's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is really understanding how their mind is developing and then matching how you are presenting information to them based on that. So I was going to do a little example about a typical exchange between a kindergartner teacher and a kindergartner. You might see, you know, little Jimmy goes over and scribbles on Susie's paper and she runs off and she cries and the teacher um, pulls him aside and very nicely says, you know, what do you think Susie was feeling when you did that? Um, or how would you, what would you think if she came over and did that to you? And it would look, you know, like she's being nice in typical kindergarten fashion. But I'm going to give you another little uh, brief uh, class in child development. So Piaget, most people have sort of heard of him if you took psychology. Um, I'm going to skip his periods that aren't school age and go right to the pre-operational phase, which is two to seven years of age. So this includes kindergartners, first graders, five, six, seven years of age. He um, divided development into periods. This one's called pre-operational. It's kind of just what it sounds like, that they are um, cognitively really focused on how things look. So when you show them two cookies plus three cookies equal five cookies, and you have this demonstration here. They're going to kind of look at the two and the three and think, that looks different than the five that are all together. And they're going to really struggle to understand that. But if you wait just a little bit longer, they're going to be in this concrete operational period where that is like fabulous for them. Practicing math facts is right up their alley. They love to do concrete operations. What distinguishes this from the next one called formal operational period is that they can't yet think abstractly. They are beginning it towards the end of the concrete period, but they're really not able to think abstractly until the formal operational period, which is 11 to 12. This is why when you try to bring algebra down and down and down and down, you sort of hit a wall around fifth, sixth grade. That you can introduce pre-algebra concepts around sixth grade and they sort of get it. They get it even easier at seventh grade, even easier in eighth grade. <clears throat> and that's because their brain is maturing. And then they're now able to think abstractly. It makes a difference if when we introduce the material. So this is a typical five and six year old. They believe other people see the world the same way they do. Um, they cannot understand another person's perspective. So when they see something really cool in a book, they'll say, look, look, look in the book. And you have to tell them, like, turn the book so I can see it. You know, they can't understand that your perspective can't see what's right in front of them. They also cannot reflect upon their thinking. If you said to them, well, what do you think of chocolate chip cookies? They would look at you like, huh? 
<laughs> but if you ask them, do you like chocolate chip cookies? Yes. Do you want me to bring you one? Yes. Um, so you can't really ask them to think about their thinking. The other part is that they are only semi-logical. So uh, <laughs> when you, you might ask uh, a child, um, is Bugs Bunny real? And he'll say, well, he can talk and bunnies don't talk, so he's probably not real. But if he didn't talk, he'd be real. So you can see that they're using a little bit of logic, but then it turns out not to be all that logical. And they also um, routinely confuse reality and fantasy. They don't have that down quite yet. So what are the consequences for children who are subjected to developmentally inappropriate standards? Well, if we go back to that case of little Jimmy who scribbled on Susie's paper, you know, what will happen when the, the child just stares at her in confusion? The teacher's going to think like, oh, you know, what a little psycho, right? He doesn't even empathize. He can't even tell me what this other kid's thinking or how she's feeling. So the teacher might walk away thinking there's something wrong with him. Uh, they might even communicate that to the parents, that they really need to work on empathy at home because their child is showing signs that they, they, they're not empathetic towards other kids. And the kid's obviously going to going to see the disapproval on the parent's face, or on the teacher's face too. So this is what's at stake with standards that are not developed with careful consideration for what's developmentally appropriate. First of all, it's, you know, from the child psychologist's perspective, you're going to stress out the kid. I'm going to be real busy because I specialize in anxiety, because I'm going to have a lot of really anxious kids. Um, but it's going to affect the classroom as a whole, because the curriculum is going to include lessons and strategies that aren't appropriate and the teacher's going to have to go over and over and over them to nail those down and it's really going to leave less time for grade appropriate materials and really no time for repeating those or repetition. So um, I'm going to talk about math facts later and when to introduce those and I'll defer to Professor Milgram but, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give a stab at it. Um, but the other things are just what I talk about. The teachers are going to see typically developing children as delayed. Parents may be informed that their children are behind. And kids are going to get measured against inappropriate standards and might be held back or tracked into remedial classes that they don't really need. So um, this is an, I don't, I'm assuming all of you have probably seen the standards, but this is actually one of the um, parts of the math standards. These are called mathematical practices, and these are the same from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. So after your crash course in child development, I want you to read those and pick out the ones that aren't exactly developmentally appropriate for kindergartners. And your eyes going to go right to number two, right? <laughs> so you're going to see that this says that, you know, students of mathematics in kindergarten should reason abstractly. Um, and we actually know that's basically impossible for them. In general, I see this with Common Core and other people as they discuss math and English standards later can uh, sort this out for me. But what I kind of saw was that they saw this college and career readiness goal and then they backed those standards down all the way to kindergarten. So instead of thinking about what's developmentally appropriate for a kindergartner, they're thinking this is where we want that kindergartner to wind up. Let's track this all back down to kindergarten and have them work on those skills in a kindergarten way. Um, there's some major, major flaws with that. We can train students to answer questions. You can train a second grader to answer abstract questions, but you have not really changed the internal process of understanding abstraction. You have trained them to answer questions. But you see this all throughout the standards. They'll talk about fewer, deeper, not a mile wide and an inch deep. They're always deeper standards, fewer and deeper. And really when I look at them, often they're requiring um, these children, eight, seven, nine, who are right in the midst of this concrete operational period. Remember, they like concrete operations, no abstractions. And they're requiring them to explain, justify, and apply principles that are abstract in nature. And this is repeated throughout the math standards. Not, it's not, no longer good enough to know that 7 minus 3 equals 4. You have to explain and justify how you came up with that answer. And probably, you know, if they're going to make you do it the other way around, which you often see them do, you've got to say something about the inverse property of mathematics. Um, and these are really abstract principles for a young child. So if you told your kid, 
I'm going to give you this watch, and when this watch is 5 o'clock, and you've taught him how, how that works, when it's 5 o'clock, come inside because it's time for dinner, done playing. And that child went outside, and he came in when that said 5 o'clock. You would think, I have taught him about the passage of time. He knows how to keep track of things, and he knows when to get inside. But if that watch stops working at 4.50, he's going to happily play for hours and hours <laughs> and hours because you've not really helped him to internalize the concept of the passage of time. You know, adults will eventually say, hey, it's been a while. We better check on that. Kids are not going to think that. He's going to be looking at his, his watch if you've got him well trained. Here are a few of the really specific standards that I wanted to pick on. But this one seemed a little odd to me. Uh, distinguish shades of meaning among related words that describe states of mind or degrees of certainty. I don't know why that's important in third grade. Um, but it certainly is asking kids to think abstractly. They've got to think about their state of mind, other people's states of mind, and then apply it to these words. And I don't think they're looking for concrete explanations. They really want to know about uh, the nuance. This one comes under that standard of nuances, the understanding that words have nuances and what the nuances are between words. I tried this on my eight-year-old. Um, she's pretty smart. But she just kept repeating back. I said, what's the difference between new and believe? She said, well, when you know it, you know it. But if you just believe it, you just believe it. And I'm like, you're right. You know, I, I knew what she was saying, but she didn't have the words to say it. So I'm not sure if that would be counted right on these assessments that come out, though. You know, she's going to have to be trained to say something different, uh, even though her understanding is probably not going to be affected one way or the other. So I like this explanation that, um, you know, if you're a kindergarten teacher and you um, are, are trying to make your math very abstract and you hear one of your little kids using Cinderella in the word problem, that Cinderella had two apples and she gave her friend an apple, how many apples does she have left? Woo, that's not abstract, right? Like, this, you should know the difference between fantasy and reality if you understand abstraction. So she's going to have to engage in a long discussion with this girl about how Cinderella is not real. And she may even convince her, right? She could say, Cinderella talks to mice, and they understand her, and she understands them. No people can do that, right? And the girl would be, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, Cinderella must not be real. She can talk to mice. But did she really internalize? Did you turn that switch on for her? Did you make her understand the difference between fantasy and reality? Well, no, you didn't. You just trained her to say Cinderella isn't real. And... Um, she might be walking away thinking, you know, like, oh, those darn mice, why are they in the movie? Because if they weren't in the movie, then Cinderella would be real. And then you ask her, well, is the Little Mermaid real? And she'll say, well, yeah, there's no mice in that movie. You know, like, it's cool. She's good. Like, Little Mermaid is indeed real. Now, if you had just waited until she was seven, she'd be like, oh, yeah, she's not real. Uh, you wouldn't have had to teach it to her. She would just really understand it because her brain could understand that by now. Um, so here's one that I hope gets covered somewhere, because I'm right in the middle of trying to teach my daughter math facts. That is a hard task. It takes a lot of repetition. you got to do it again and again and again and again. So I was a little curious about why it started in kindergarten. One of the standards is that they will fluently add and subtract within five. That's not that hard, right? It's only going up to five. Um, we do know that they'll have to be drilled on this, right? Again and again. And we do know that they are, oh yeah, they're in the pre-operational stage, which means that they haven't yet fully understood operations and how to change things. And if you had waited until they were about seven, they would learn those math facts a lot easier. And this is probably why in other curriculums you usually see memorizing and being fluent on math facts in the first grade, or maybe even in the second half of first grade, they're starting that. Uh, that's what I'm a little bit more used to. I was a little surprised to see it in the kindergarten standards. But this is, again, kind of what I saw in general with the standards, that they're trying to almost push down heavier, higher level things on the lower grades. And it takes a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of the teacher's time to get them to all know it fluently. means you can answer that question within three seconds, right? Somewhere in there. So you've got to get these little kindergartners. What's two plus three? Five. You know, you've got to get them really fast, and that's going to take a lot of repetition, and it's going to take up a lot of time that they should have spent on more basic skills of counting, one-to-one -one correspondence, moving things around, things that are appropriate for a kindergartner to be working on. Some of them are going to be able to do this, 
but then the teacher's going to be wondering what's wrong with these other kids that don't know how to do this, and she's going to be worried about her own evaluations. Um, there's lots of really interesting research on fluency of math facts, but we all know it's very important. There's a study, I don't know if they'll cover it later, but they did brain scans. So this is the neuroscience and psychology. I mean, brain scans of uh, kids who were 12th graders doing math facts, and they were doing fMRIs. So this is sophisticated stuff. And they saw the ones that had them memorized and were fluent were using a different part of their brain than the ones who had to do computations. And we've all kind of known that, like, okay, if you don't practice your math facts and know them, then your brain power is being used by doing the computations for the little math facts, and it's not opened up to explore the other higher level thinking things. But what the showed, study showed was that actually it's more important than that, that they actually don't even develop that framework there if they haven't made the math facts fluent and automatic. And those kids scored much higher on the PSATs. So we know that it actually does affect not just those math facts, but higher level thinking. But you've got to balance that with, okay, should we really start it in kindergarten? Um, are we going to create that phenomenon of math anxiety, which is real? They've also done fMRIs on seven to nine-year-olds and asked them to do math facts. And they find that the fear center in the brain just gets lit on fire for some of these kids because they're anxious about doing mathematics. These are particularly the kids that are under the gun with timed mathematics in kindergarten and first grade. They get really anxious about that. So you've got to balance the need for it and not stressing them out. So the social emotional goals are really the ones that, um, I know they're not called that, but when you read them, you know that's what they really are. Uh, they're under the speaking or the listening, and some of them are even under the writing. Um, but, you know, kindergartners are at the point in their development where being, oh, okay, that's my son, isn't he cute? I have to use kids I know so they won't sue me for using their images. <laughs> um, so he asked me to take this picture of him. I was visiting him in his kindergarten classroom. He built that little sculpture with sand, so proud of it, wanted me to take his picture. You can just tell by the look on his face. He's happy as clam. This is what kindergartners are doing at this point. They are being independent. And this is very important because we don't want them to be dependent, right? We want them to organize their stuff on their own, tie their shoes on their own, pull their pants up on their own after they go potty. So that is what they're working on, and they're very proud of that, and that's what they should be working on is being independent. They're also working on being competent, exhibiting mastery, being creative. Now, here's one of the kindergarten standards. That's a social-emotional standard, really, housed under writing that they are to, with guidance and support from adults, respond to questions and suggestions from peers and add details to strengthen writing as needed. Instead of proposing something that would be more aligned with a kindergartner's goal of exploring creative independence, instead they've suggested the social emotional goal of being dependent on other people. So this little kindergartner is the little adult, right? And she's going to hold this board meeting where she's going to present her writing She's going to elicit feedback from her peers, and then she's going to take that criticism, feedback, back to the writing table and edit her work to include details and strengthen her writing based on the suggestions of other people. I mean, anyone who's had kids is like, uh, what? You know, that's not going to happen. Um, but what are really the emotional effects of this? Well, we don't really know because these are new standards. There was no citation after it that says, oh, see the research here that showed this was a really good idea. So since there's no research yet, I'm going to hypothesize based on my expertise in child development that we are going to see um, a loss of creativity uh, because we're getting started early on conformity, right? That you have to figure out what the other people want you to do and incorporate it in there. And we know that kids' level of creativity goes down for every year that they're in school. But this little exercise is going to speed that up a little bit. They're going to get frustrated because their child is internally motivated to be independent. And you're asking them to be dependent on the other person. You're probably going to start some conflicts out on the playground. You said that my cat should be orange, and I thought it was cool when it was black. And why did you say that? And I had to change my work, and that's not fair. And you're definitely going to see lots of tears. Uh, you're going to see my little son's face when somebody says, I think you should stick a flag in it and sticks it into his sculpture. <gasps> Crushed, right? So here are some of the other ones. I'm going to go through these uh, more quickly. So speaking and listening under kindergarten, they're going to speak audibly and present their thoughts, feelings, and ideas clearly. Again, a little board meeting adult, um, capable of adult exchanges. The first graders are going to build on others' talk in conversations by responding to the comments of others through multiple exchanges. 
What did you think of the teacher's presentation on Little Red Riding Hood? I thought it was lovely. <laughs> what do you think we should do next in a book club? I think we should, again, read Little Red Riding Hood. Second graders are going to follow agreed upon rules for discussions. For example, they're going to do something that signals they're going to gain the floor in respectful ways. Listen to others with care speak one at a time about topics and texts under discussion. So they say that teachers wear many hats. Have you guys heard that? They wear many hats. They're mentors, they're mothers, they're fathers, they're therapists, artists, scientists. Um, but now after reading these standards, I'm afraid they're going to have to wear yet another one. And that would be the hat of a magician. Sarah, <laughs> they, They are going to have to somehow get these little kids to sit down and do these things that we can't get adults to do. So how, how did this happen? You know, how did it happen that a kindergarten goal is to hold a board meeting? Um, and so they were talking about the committees, but when I look at the committee, I didn't see any early childhood educators, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten. kindergarten uh, I did see one, I think, or two, maybe elementary school teachers. And there were no child development experts on there. It certainly weren't psychologists or uh, pediatricians or maybe a neuropsychologist. In your work, you often hear about this interdisciplinarian approach and how that can be helpful, that somebody might say, hey, let's think about the standard on this way. And I'm not saying that I'd, I'd, I'd be the expert. I would not. I wouldn't want to be on that committee. <laughs> but I would defer to the people who really know the content area. But they might learn something from somebody in a different discipline about the timing or something like that. So additionally, it's not apparent that the individual standards were tied to any research. I mean, normally when you see something this important, you see these citations after it that have little people's names and dates, and that's because they're based on research. So what do standards look like in other disciplines? So this is just one random standard I pulled out. This is from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And they set for some standards treating childhood OCD. So each step or phase is guided by research and science, and not just any research. This has to be state-of-the-art, published in an academic journal, peer-reviewed. You know your peers would love to tear you down, so they are looking for any flaw, making sure that you're at the top standard before they will publish your work. So surely you'd think that the academic standards for a nation of children would be based on research. We don't want them to be little guinea pigs in experiments, or mice in psychology are the experiments, and we're going to just see how this goes, and you know, hopefully it'll all work out. Um, we would like to see that it's based on research, and we demand that in other fields, that you can even see, like, okay, so the recommendation is for moderate and severe OCD medication is indicated in addition to CBT, and you even see this little CS afterwards. I included the key for you. They're going to tell you how strong of a recommendation that is and what type of science that is based on. Um, and they're even going to tell you some, it doesn't mean that everything has to be that way, but if it's just an opinion or kind of an option, they're going to tell you this is just an opinion or kind of an option. So then you can weigh that evidence. So for the last one, I'm just going to leave you with a slide of pictures. Okay, so this is what a developmentally appropriate kindergarten classroom probably looks like. You know, we're going to hold off on drilling down the math facts probably till first grade. And they're going to spend a lot of time exploring, creating, and spending time independently working on some things. Um, so those are just pictures from my kids' classroom. All right, thank you very much.